Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast of the diversity of UV Viz NIR techniques for nanomaterial characterization, how to use transmission, scatter transmission, diffuse reflectance, and angular resolve scattering measurements to characterize nanostructures. I'm Meg LaRue, Managing Editor of Spectroscopy, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this web seminar presented by Spectroscopy and sponsored by Perkin Elmer. Perkin Elmer is a global leader focused on improving the health and safety of people and the environment through the development and delivery of technologies, services, and solutions that are used in critical applications. From environmental monitoring, water analysis, and food safety, to clinical diagnostics, drug discovery, and biomedical research, Perkin Elmer is committed to advancing science, collaborating with our customers, and putting innovation into action for a healthier today and even better tomorrow. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive, and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the red Q&A widget at the bottom of the presentation window. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the small green icon in the upper right-hand corner of the slide window, or by hovering your mouse over the lower right-hand corner and dragging the window to the desired size. The slides will advance automatically during the event. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the question mark help widget in the dock at the bottom of your presentation window. Before we get started with today's presentation, we have two brief polling questions. Please click directly on your screen to answer. The first question is, what segment are you part of? Academia, doing research on new nanomaterials, government slash regulatory, industry, or other? I will repeat the question. What segment are you part of? Academia, doing research on new nanomaterials, government slash regulatory, industry, or other? Our next polling question is, what is your primary application of interest for nanomaterials? Environmental, biomedical, industrial, or energy? I'll repeat the question. What is your primary application of interest for nanomaterials? Environmental, biomedical, industrial, or energy? Thank you for taking those polling questions today. I would now like to introduce today's speakers, Dr. Chatty Steffen and Dr. Jeffrey L. Taylor. Dr. Chatty Steffen is the Manager of Global Applications Nanotechnology at Perkin Elmer. He received his PhD in Analytical Chemistry from the University of Montreal in 2008. Dr. Steffen then worked as Product Manager for QSAR Risk Assessment Services before he joined Perkin Elmer as an inorganic product specialist supporting the inorganic business. Over the past few years, his main research activities at Perkin Elmer have been in developing single particle ICPMS. Dr. Jeffrey Taylor has a master's degree in toxicology and a PhD in spectroscopy and biochemistry from the University of Georgia. He has been with Perkin Elmer for more than 33 years. During that time, he has been involved in software development, in instrumental design, applications development, and customer support. Thank you for joining us today. Chatty, please get us started. Thank you, Meg. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you're uh, dialing in. Uh, we're happy to have you on today's webcast. Uh, today's webcast will be uh, given by Dr. Jeffrey Taylor and myself, talking about the diversity of UV vis near IR or spectroscopy, molecular spectroscopy techniques for nanomaterial characterization. This webcast is uh, the third in the series. Um, uh, hosted by spectroscopy. The first webcast, we were talking about single particle ICPMS and its advantages in analyzing nanoparticle and environmental matrices. The webcast, the recording of the webcast is available on the link that you see on the screen. The second webcast that we hosted uh, uh, was uh, talking about the characterization of nanomaterial, uh, thick organic layers using uh, uh, the Anxian direct sample analysis time of flight mass spectrometer. Basically, it was talking about the organic layer sitting on top of the core, uh, metallic core of nanoparticles that were measured through the webcast number one. And today's webcast, webcast number three, will talk on the diversity of the UVVs near IR for the characterization of nanomaterials and nanostructures. More specifically, we're going to be, uh, Dr. Jeff Taylor is going to be talking about the characterization of single wall carbon energy. Uh, using the cuvette-based measurement. 
is also going to go over uh, the angular reflectance measurements when he is going to look at nanostructure, analyzing the transparent and opaque layer surfaces. And the third part of the, uh, of the webcast, Dr. Jeff is going to be talking about the characterization of large and small particles distribution in cosmetics and sunscreen, and that's using the integrated sphere uh, <coughs> part of the Lambda 1050 series. Um, now, why we are doing this? We are doing this because nanotechnology or nanotechnology-based uh, consumer products are increasing. We are using them on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, there are the new generation of materials being used uh, on a daily basis. If we look at this picture uh, and look at the, at the items that we, uh, we see, we're going to definitely be touching based on the sunscreen present into the family having uh, that, uh, that uh, lunch uh, on the grass. If you see back in, in, in the picture, you will see some cosmetics. So again, we're going to be looking at how we look at nanomaterials in cosmetics. And if you look at the buildings, all those uh, new gases, self-washing gases and so on, we're going to look and investigate how uh, uv vis near IR or spec, uh, spectroscopy technique can help us investigate uh, and further advance nanoscience. And uh, we are at this stage is because if we are looking at what uh, is needed from an analytical perspective, and we look at, um, at, at the science perspective and we look at the, the scientific community, what we are looking for is really for new ways or for metrology analytical methods to track engineer nanomaterials and validate models. We want to also be able to use technologies or platforms that allow us to look at nanostructure to better understand them. And uh, this, is, uh, this is where we came into that big part of the series. So recapping on, on today's of achievement and what we have done in the past. So we started with webcast one talking about single particle ICP MS and how can we put uh, the whole circle of characterization of nanomaterials from particle size to composition to looking at what are the functions sitting on the surface using the DSA top. And today we're going to actually add an extra dimension uh, to this, uh, to the nanomaterial characterization by looking at the UV vis near IR and its capability in, uh, in help researchers and help uh, industrial industry leaders advance their nanomaterials uh, and push the nano field uh, furthermore. So today's uh, today's presentation is going to be really talking about uh, the lambda. Uh, UV vis near IR and a different and a different module that could be mounted on this platform that allow us that give us the flexibility to analyze uh, different nanomaterials uh, from the uh, an ARTA uh, module to an integrated sphere to the center mount. Uh, all those that Dr. Jeff is going to be talking about um, in a few uh, in in the next slide, Jeff. Thank you very much, Chatty, and a good day to everybody. We're going to start out by looking at analysis techniques for single-walled carbon nanotubes. These are probably the simplest types of assays uh, that you can do on nanomaterials. It's basically putting the carbon nanotube suspended in solution in a cuvette and running an absorption spectra. Nanomaterials uh, do two things very well. They absorb light and they scatter light. How they absorb and scatter is very much a dependency on the size and shape of the nanotube, as, or the nanoparticle, as well as the uh, uh, shape of it and the environment that it's in. So we're going to look at first six techniques for single-walled carbon nanotubes, uh, one in terms of sample composition, Dispersion efficiency, degree of indiv individualization, and sample purity are techniques associated with ultracentrifugation and purification of the nanotubes. We're also going to look at how nanotubes can interact with dyes and how we can measure the efficiency of ultracentrifuge ultra separations. Carbon nanotubes are rather unique in that their absorbance comes from the sp2 hybridized carbon atoms uh, 
that are actually in the uh, in the single wall nanotube uh, wall. And these carbons can have one of two types of characteristics. They can be a metallic or they can be a semiconductor. And which one is which is determined by the electron distribution around the given carbon atom. And this slide shows you how the differences for the metallic atoms as well as the semiconductor atoms in blue and the metallic in red. These two types of uh, metallic and semiconductor determine the energy of the transition. Here you see an energy diagram, and the metallic you can see is a high energy transition by the length of the arrow there. The semiconducting transitions are smaller than the metallic, and there's actually two of these that are typical in single-walled carbon nanotubes, and they differ slightly in energy. What this translates to in the spectra is, I've, in this spectra, I've color-coded the regions for the metallic transition, which is in red. Obviously, it's a larger energy transition, which means it's a shorter wavelength of light. The shorter the wavelength of light, the more energetic that light is. We then have two, some, those two semiconductor transitions that occur between the 600 and 900 nanometer region for one and the 900 and 1400 region for the other. And you can actually tell the, the species of your nanotube by what peaks you have in what region that would indicate the composition of your nanotubes. When you separate nanotubes in an ultracentrifuge, you want to be able to characterize the different bands in your ultracentrifugation. The dispersion efficiency analysis looks at, if you'll see on the graph on the left, you have the ultracentrifuge spectra in blue on the bottom and the raw dispersion at the top. And with a simple peak ratio, here it's done at around 650 nanometers on a peak, and you simply measure the absorbance of the uh, ultracentrifuge peak as well as the raw material peak, and you can see that uh, you can get about a 9% efficiency here for this particular one. On the right is the spectra normalized and superimposed, and you can see the black raw nanotubes are much less differentiated than the peak structure that you now see of the purified nanotubes in blue after ultracentrifugation. This is a picture of an ultracentrifuge tube, and for the degree of individualization, you have three regions here. The, the F1, which is the defect free single walled carbon nanotubes, and then there are two other uh, regions. One is defective. Uh, carbon nanotubes, which would be where there'd be any rips or tears in the, in the carbon structure of the tube or any type of deformity in the tube so that it's not a perfect nanotube. And finally, at the bottom is the, basically the garbage and grunge of impurities and so forth. On the right, you can see the spectra. Obviously, the black spectra has your typical carbon nanotubes uh, peaks, and the red and the green for the defective uh, you don't see that structure. It's kind of getting lost in the, uh, in the garbage of the baseline. You can evaluate the purity of carbon nanotubes by looking at, you'll see we've converted here to wave number to get a little bit better distribution as a function of energy in the peaks. But the area that it's pointing to is the resonant area in white is then ratioed with the non-resident background, which is basically a, a, the, off, the signal from the, the, uh, all the things that are there that are not carbon nanotubes. And typically for a pure uh, carbon nanotube, this would be about a 0.15 or a 1 and 6 ratio. In other words, 1 being the white area and 6 being the blue shaded area. When you have impure nanotubes, it can be as bad as 0 0.03, which is uh, the equivalent of a 1 in 60. So you can see as that resonant area decreases, you're getting less pure carbon nanotubes. This is almost identical to the technique of doing DNA uh, ratioing uh, 
uh, to see the contaminations of proteins and DNA. A lot of people use dyes that associate with carbon nanotubes. These dyes uh, on the left look almost like a fatty acid. They have a uh, hydrophilic region that associates with polar water molecules, and then there's a hydrophobic region that would associate with the apolar carbon nanotube surface. So you're looking at that pyrrolene functional moiety is the one that would associate with the carbon nanotubes, and then the, the polar region would be what's exposed to the solvent. There are two spectra here. The one on the left, you can see the pyrrolene in green, and then you can also see uh, the one in the middle, uh, I'm sorry, the one that's up top that is black is the uh, dye associated with the carbon nanotubes, and you can see that distinct two-peak structure there sticking out from the carbon nanotube spectra. The other spectra is when you displace the dye with SDBS, it displaces the dye for the, for the, uh, the detergent there, and you can see the reduction in that. The uh, spectra on the right show that in a little bit more detail, and you can see how you can easily tell when the dye is associated with the carbon nanotubes as opposed to when it's not. Lastly, you can see uh, how you can identify different species of carbon nanotubes. This is kind of a plot where we've color-coded the various peaks to individual species. This is a rather crowded plot that has uh, 12 different species of carbon nanotubes. Obviously, if you were trying to uh, isolate an individual species, spectroscopy like this could be very informative in terms of telling you not only the number of species that are there, but it could also be quantitated with how much of each species is there. Moving on now to another type of technique, we're going to be looking at particle characterization in commercial products. And these, are, these commercial products are sunscreens and cosmetics. And a, uh, a special tribute here to the individual you see pictured there Jillian DeLugas was an intern at Perkin Elmer starting her freshman year in high school. She published her first application note for Perkin Elmer as primary author when she was 14 years old as she was finishing up her freshman year. Over her four-year period here, she published four application notes, talked at numerous scientific conventions and workshops. She's now a freshman at North Carolina State University in the engineering department. So she is the actual developer of the technique I'm about to describe to you now. She had an instrument in her living room for four years where she did her research, which I suppose shows you that you can pretty much do science just about anywhere. The accessory she was using is called an integrating sphere. An integrating sphere is a special device that can look at solid materials or even liquids and it can collect the scatter and transmission. On the left-hand side there, you see a light beam striking a sample, and this is demonstrating the backward scattered light off of the sample, or also diffuse reflectance, and also the little oval there in the sample is the light that would be absorbed. The bottom blue region shows you scatter transmission, where the light passes through the sample and comes out in, in, in a hemispherical fashion. The integrating sphere is the device that actually can collect both types of uh, sample scattering by where you place it. You'll notice in transmission, the sample is placed in front of the sphere, and the sphere collects the light. In reflection mode, the sphere is placed on the opposite side of the sphere at the diffuse reflectance port, and you can then obtain spectra that characterizes both types of scattering. What we're working with here is basically uh, Raleigh Tyndall scattering, which equation is here. There are two color-coded green and blue segments here that is particularly of interest that regards scattering intensity is dependent on the diameter of the particle and the wavelength of light. Uh, particles smaller than the wavelength of light, there is a wavelength dependent, uh, dependency on the scatter, whereas larger particles, uh, there is not a wavelength dependent. 
This is one of the reasons why the sky is blue and clouds are white. Scatter from the gas molecules in the air are smaller, and it's heavily weighted towards the blue, whereas colloidal water molecules in clouds scatter evenly, and they're white. Key to this assay is a device called a center mount, which you see pictured on the right-hand side in the bottom, that goes into the sphere. This allows you to place the sample into the sphere, and the purpose of this is it collects all of the scattered light, both forward and backward scatter. Therefore, any light lost on a sample in a center mount is due only to absorbance because you're collecting all of the scattered light. We can use this geometry to our advantage in looking at sunscreens. Uh, titanium dioxide and zinc oxide are typical nano components of sunscreen and are used in sunscreens to uh, scatter the uh, more energetic UVA and UVB, therefore protecting the skin. Here you see the blocking region of the sunscreens and the light scattering region. These, this, these spectra here are is, are sunscreens that do not have nanoparticles in them. They block light chemically. You can see the center mount spectra is close to 100%, whereas the center mount spectra, I'm sorry, the center mount spectra is the one up there close to 100%, and then the one spectra below that with the dotted line is the sample placed at the scatter transmission port. These two spectra can then be used to characterize what's going on in the sample. And what's so novel about this method is it has the ability to characterize absorbance, large particle scattering, and small particle scattering. Now, it's, I guess, truly not a nanoparticle technique, nanoparticles being between 1 and 100 nanometers. What is classified here as a nano or small particle would probably be less than three or 400 nanometers. So you're looking at samples grouped below smaller than three or 400 nanometers and larger than three or 400 nanometers. The technique revolves around the center mount spectra, which on the left I've simplified here with just two lines to make it a little bit easier to look at. But you take your center mount spectra, which is the top blue line, and the area above that would be absorbance. You then take this dotted hypothetical line, which is the axis offset, which is due to large particle scattering. So the difference between the absorbance and the rest of it then is that purple area or blue area, which would be uh, indicative of large particle scattering. And then the area below that line is due to smaller or nanoparticle scattering. So we can take a look at what we have here is the results in a bar chart on the left, these are sunscreens that do not contain nanoparticles, and you can see they're dominated uh, by large particle scattering, which is part of the emulsion uh, that the sunscreen is, as well as the pink is nano and the green is absorbance. And we do have some natural nan smaller particles in this, uh, but if we move over to the right-hand side, you can see that the, the larger particles go down and the pink, which are the nanoparticles, increase. One of the things about cosmetics is they have an absorption all to their own due to coloration. Most cosmetics, well, sunscreens are typically white. Most cosmetics are, are, have coloration to them to obviously do what cosmetics do. So this technique is able to separate out that absorption. You see the three cosmetics on the uh, right-hand side of the right-hand graph are much higher in absorption due to the actual coloration of the cosmetic. Now, the, the one question that's of interest here is why don't we see more nanoparticles contributing in the, uh, in the cosmetics that have nanoparticles? We think the reason for this is aggregation. When they're in the emulsion of the, um, of the sunscreen or the cosmetic, they actually aggregate together. We did an experiment just recently where we took sunscreen, diluted it in methanol and then water, and sure enough, in the diluted sunscreen, after it was taken uh, diluted down, the nanoparticles outnumber the larger particles uh, by almost two to one. So this would be an excellent mechanism
to look at aggregation in final products because in many final products, your nanoparticles might not be nanoparticles anymore. They may have aggregated and are no longer nanoparticles. We're now going to move on to characterization of nanoparticles by angular resolve scattering techniques. And this involves an accessory called an ARTA, or an automated reflectance transmission accessories. And we're first going to look at suspended nanoparticles and then also a solid version of nanoparticles, which are solar cell transparent conductive oxides. The ARTA is a device that has a movable integrating sphere detector that is able to move around the sample in 360 degrees. The sample itself in the center stage there with the red line, which would be your sample, is also capable of moving through 360 degrees. So with this accessory, we can literally change the angle of incidence on the sample by rotating the center table, or change the angle at which we're collecting light, and you see a typical configuration with the T for the detector in transmission mode, and a typical configuration with the detector in reflectance mode. This is a polar graph showing you a typical glass sample and a complete characterization in an ARTA accessory. You can see the light striking the sample, which is here at 45 degrees. You can see a very sharp specular reflectance peak, and then a much broader uh, uh, scatter peak. Even though glass is clear, light tends to scatter through the glass and make a wider cone. The characterization of these cones and the angles of how scatter drops off is extremely informative in characterizing nanoparticles. This shows you simply an empty sample compartment. This is nothing more than the detector uh, collecting light as a function of angle. You see we've gone from a, uh, a minus 80 to a plus 80. The graph on the right is a, li is a linear scale. The graph on the right is a logarithmic scale. And not too terribly interesting. What is important is we have an ability to reference beam attenuate the instrument because it's a double beam instrument. And this is, increases the dynamic range of the instrument drastically. You can see here we've characterized at least five orders of magnitude, possibly six. It's getting a little noisy there in the six order of magnitude. But if you look at that scale for percent transmission, that is fairly impressive. We are going across almost six orders of magnitude in transmission there, which is very important because it's these uh, drop-off areas that are going to become very important in nanoparticle characterization. Here is a simple diffuser screen. You can see by the picture that it is white, which means it's diffusing because of large particle scattering. There are probably very few nanostructures in this sample, although there might be a couple. We can see the linear and the logarithmic scales here, and notice the difference now. On the right-hand log scale, you'll see that the scattering doesn't simply drop off. It has almost a little hump there at around minus 40 and plus 40 that is indicative of the combination of large and small particle scattering. So the diffuser plate really isn't a very interesting sample. So we'll move on to some uh, gold nanotubes here. I'm sorry, gold uh, uh, nanoparticles. And we have these gold particles in 10, 30, 60, and 100 nanometer sizes. And you can also see the nanoparticles in a 5 millimeter path length cuvette over on the right. And these are simply direct spectra. They look pretty much they're in transmission rather than absorbance. So the absorbance peak is a downward peak. And you can see it's pretty, pretty regular for what you'd see of the spectra of a nanoparticle suspended in solution. We can, also, we can collect spectra as a function of angle on the ARTA. So here you see a stacked plot of spectra as a function of angle uh, going from uh, zero, and we're going in half degree increments. And you can see that something is happening right around five degrees. That peak due to the nanoparticles uh, is disappearing, and another spectra is, uh, is forming. Uh, 
what you're looking at here is the transition from the absorbance of the nanoparticle, which is that peak around 520, to the scattering spectra of the nanoparticle, which does not have that peak. Indeed, it has a totally different spectral profile. So we can actually see the transition from the absorbance to the scattering component of a nanoparticle, which is very important for, for characterization. Here we see the angular resolved, uh, uh, the angular resolved profile of these 60 nanometer particles at three different wavelengths. Notice now we have a considerable amount of structure here. The, the little dip you see between 5 and 10 degrees is literally the transition from the absorbance component of the nanoparticle to the scattering component. The red uh, line, which is the, the 520, which is the peak for that 60 degree nanoparticle, has the most definition. But also, not only is that transition important, but the slope of the follow-off of the scattering is going to be based on size, shape, and environment of the nanoparticle. These things will change not only on size and shape and structure, but also on the environment that the nanoparticle is in. Obviously, the red line, which is right at the peak, shows the most definition, with the 700 nanometer line showing the least amount of definition. These are uh, uh, angular resolve scattering from a solid sample. These are transparent conductive oxides that are used in solar cells. And you can see how these solid samples show much more definition uh, around the absorbance peak and as you go out into the scatter. And indeed, the, the shape of these can be mo mathematically modeled with uh, with uh, theoretical scattering based on size and shape and its interaction with the wavelength of light that you're using. We move, we're looking for a unique sample. Uh, nanoparticles, uh, uh, gold nanoparticles are nice, but what say we could, if we move to something like a food, uh, milk. Uh, the butter fat in milk, the fatty acid, is in the range of a nanoparticle, whereas the larger proteins are much larger than that. And obviously, that's why milk is white. It's the predominance of the larger, uh, the larger protein scattering, much like cloud scattering. But the spectra here is very interesting. You can see the scattering drop off, but you can see there's enough, there is still a transition at about the right point from absorbance into scattering. And when we look at this, not quite as interesting as the nanoparticles, but still there's a, a drop off here. This is a much more complex sample. This is uh, more complex than simple suspension of gold nanoparticles. We're looking at scattering due to both large, uh, large proteins as well as small fatty acids that combine to, to give this profile. So this is an area where much could be done in terms of characterizing this and uh, looking at the relationship of butter fat to proteins. We're going to finish up by looking at the angular resolve scatter techniques in reflectance mode. Up to now, we've been looking at a transmission measurement, which is actually one of the more easier techniques in that the, the light typically interacts with your sample through a longer path length. When you move to absorption, uh, to reflectance, things become a bit more difficult. It's a more difficult measurement to make and also a less sensitive measurement. To start out with, we're going to look at a rather bland sample here that Spectralon is a white material that is considered almost a perfect Lambertian scatterer. And you can see this. The, uh, the graph on the left is a change in the angle of incidence for reflection, and the, glass, the graph on the right is changing the wavelength. As you can see, we get this, the same parabola. It only differs in its intensity, whether we change the wavelength or change the angle, 
we get the same measurement, which is exactly what you'd expect from a nondescript Lambertian scatterer. Fortunately, th things get much more interesting when you go to nanoparticles. Here's our white diffuser plate again. And this plate was selected because it has a glossy side, which is shiny, and a dull side. Same material, but difference in surface structure. This is the reflectance of the glossy side. Not very interesting at the three wavelengths. You're seeing the specular uh, peak there at around 90. This was done at a 45 degree angle of incidence. So your reflected light is at 90 degrees and it's pretty nondescript after that. So there's not a whole lot happening here. The dull side is a little bit different. You can see I'm showing you the configuration of the detector over here with the R circle. That's where the detector would be and how the sample would be angled. And this is the, diffuse, the dull plate, the dull side of the diffuser plate. A little bit more interesting, but there's not a whole lot going on there. You're looking at the angular resolved reflection uh, of basically the large and small particle scattering in this uh, diffuser plate. Now, we're going to move on to one of the most interesting samples that I run. The, the, the best nano sample I could find as a solid are actually butterfly wings. Now, before we go any further, I want to be very clear no butterflies were killed in this research. I have a butterfly bush in my backyard, and come August, it is absolutely loaded with butterflies, some of which naturally expire and fall to the ground underneath, and I simply go out and collect them. What makes butterflies so interesting is that the color in the butterfly wing is not due to pigments. It is literally due to small nanoparticle scattering and diffraction. A butterfly wing is composed of scales, which you see on the left. This is a, a, an electron micrograph of a typical butterfly wing. And then you see an enlargement. And this sample is a wealth of nanostructures. You can see that there are small ellipsoidal nanoparticles on these cross beam supports, and you see much larger supports there. So you have the size of the supporting network as well as these really interesting ellipsoidal nanoparticles that are held onto the wing. And that's what literally gives butterflies the, the bright blue and orange and reds are mostly from the butterfly wing and these nanostructures acting as a diffraction grating. So we take a typical butterfly wing here. This one happens to be orange. And I run a simple reflectance spectra of it. And you can see it's not very interesting. It looks almost like a cutoff filter. Uh, pigments may be involved in the region below 500 nanometers where there's almost no reflection at uh, 400 and 500 there. But then we have this interesting structure on the side of this. So there's something going on there that's a little bit different. And the, uh, the, the changeover happens right at about 700, and then I selected a spot in the middle of that transition. If you look on the right, you'll see the angular resolved reflectance scattering of the two lower wavelengths, and there's really not a whole lot going on there. If you look at the intensity of the reflection, it's responsible for that's a fair amount of noise, but the reflection is very low at that point. Of more interest is the 700 and 600 wavelengths. And you can see here in the angular resolve, we're now getting some really interesting things happening, especially in this 700 nanometer region, which corresponded to that inflection point. And what you're actually seeing here is the angular resolve scatter of these little ellipsoidal nano rods that are attached to this and that's giving rise to this peak right at, about, uh, right at about 70 degrees here on this reflection angular resolve scatter. So that was the visible, but we also have the ability to go into the near infrared here. And what going into the near infrared will do for us is it allows us to look at larger structures. These would be structures that are larger than the nanoparticles, which the ellipsoidal uh, nanoparticles on the wing would be, 
we're now actually looking at these larger support structures. And you can see from the Angular Resolve data, at, um, I picked several areas out of the, uh, out of the spectra on the left that's in the near infrared region. And I did the Angular Resolved on that. And you can see that, <coughs> excuse me, depending on the wavelength, the peak tends to shift as well as the slopes fall off on either side. You'll also note that this is a more pronounced angular uh, resolved reflection scatter than there was for the, the uh, ellipsoidal nanostructures. What's probably happening here is this larger grid structure is basically shielding some of the smaller nanoparticles from getting illuminated by the light. So you get a cleaner definition in the near infrared because you're looking at the more visible uh, larger structures, but those structures in themselves uh, tend to shield the smaller ellipsoidal particles underneath. So in finishing up, one of the things that I wanted to show in this presentation was the range of applications in that UV visible near-infrared spectroscopy has to characterize nanomaterials. All nanomaterials, uh, to some degree, absorb and scatter. The degree to which they do this is very different depending on their size, shape, composition, and the environment that they're in, all of which can be mathematically modeled to predict scattering at various wavelengths and angle. What is uniquely different about uh, UV visible near infrared spectroscopy and the accessories we have is our ability to look at a more diverse group of samples than other techniques. With these techniques, for example, in the integrating sphere work with the cosmetics, the cosmetics or the sunscreen were basically uh, smeared onto a supporting quartz structure that just like putting them onto your skin, you, you put it onto the quartz structure and then you put that in to make your measurement. Our, our methodologies here can accommodate solids, liquids, creams, gels, paste, coatings on, on support media, pretty much just about anything but a gas. And our ability to make both transmission and reflection measurements allows us to fully explore the, the, the scattering and absorption that's happening in all of these uh, nanoparticle compositions. This means that these techniques can be used in the final products. We're not restricted to just making measurements on basically pristine nanoparticles. We can actually analyze the nanoparticles when they're in the sunscreen, uh, when they're in a solid, the ability here is to do formulation and quality control work in the final products that contain nanotubes. So that is really the take-home message that I wanted to, to leave you with, is that these are techniques that can now work in the, the business end of what you use nanoparticles for, whether you're putting them in a coating on a windshield, uh, whether you're using them uh, to make things black, like NASA does on a lot of their uh, photography, on their space probes, they actually use nanoparticles. Nothing is blacker than the right size nanoparticle coated on something. So it's our ability in, in this particular area to work with this diversity of, of final formulations and final products that, that is the strength of these techniques. So on that, I'm going to hand this back to Chatty, who will uh, finish things up for us with the Q&A. Thank you, Jeff. Um, um, moving forward, it's really two, two more slides to go before we can, we can open uh, the floor for uh, the question and answer session. Uh, Jeff went through the UV vis near IR, and as I mentioned, this is a webcast, this is the third webcast that we went through. Uh, and this is really was dedicated to show you how this technology help us look for nanoparticles in the finished product in, uh, into, into that product that you are actually using or you are selling or you are manufacturing. Uh, just a quick reminder, 
uh, that uh, the prior webcast, webcast one and webcast two, uh, talking about the single particle ICPMS or uh, the direct sampling uh, time of flight, uh, looking at the organic layers. They're all recorded. They're all available online uh, for your reviewing. And very shortly, uh, the webcast that uh, Jeff um, uh, uh, went through or we just concluded kind of on the UV vis near IR will be uh, very shortly available uh, for review. With that, I thank you very much for your attention, and I will hand it back uh, to Meg. Thank you very much for that informative presentation. Before we get started on the question and answer session, I would like to remind our audience how to submit questions. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the red Q&A widget at the bottom of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. Our first question is for Jeff. Can you analyze single-walled carbon nanotubes embedded in a solid polymer? I see no reason why you could not. The, the spectroscopy is going to be different between a, a, any type of nanoparticle suspended in solution and its final resting place in the product because both the absorbance and the scattering of nanoparticles is critically dependent on the environment and basically because of the, uh, this type of spectroscopy is, re is related to the electron structure of what you're looking at. So the nanoparticles, depending on its electron structure and how it interacts with the, uh, uh, with in its final formulation place, uh, is what you would want to do. So I, I see no reasons why you, you couldn't do either any nanoparticle really embedded in a, uh, in a solid. The, the more desirable measurement would try to be to make a transmission measurement on it. If that's not possible, you can always drop back to the reflectance measurement. So between those two techniques, you should be able to do this. Okay, uh, another question for you, Jeff. Does the dye reflect the same color or a different color? Uh, in the, I'm not quite sure uh, if they're talking about carbon nanotubes or the butterfly. I'm going to I'm going to assume that they're probably talking about the the color that was in the butterfly wings. But the the dye for carbon nanotubes you're looking at the color of that dye, it simply associates itself and you can see it merged into the, uh, uh, into the composite you know, when it binds to the carbon nanotube. You can tell it's bound because it shifts slightly. So you should be, if, if you're doing dye work with carbon nanotubes, you can tell if it's bound to the carbon nanotube by whether or not it, it shifts or not. Okay, um, another one for you. Does do the butterfly wing design is is it used in the textile industry? I don't think so. Uh, the textile industry works with dyes. The difference uh, with dyes and pigments. A dye is a water soluble uh, material that simply gets absorbed into fabric. Uh, that's one of the reasons why if you use hot water in your wash, a lot of your colors can come out. Pigments are non soluble. And it's usually solid material like paints that have pigments in them. Butterfly wings are very, very unique. As a matter of fact, it's not just butterfly wings. Uh, just about all of these metallic-looking colors uh, on beetles or any other insects are from surface nanostructures. And that would be very, very difficult to duplicate and I would assume rather expensive you literally would have to have your clothing with a diffraction grating in it, which uh, there may be a market for that somewhere, but I don't think these are traditionally used in the textile industry, no. Okay. Um, I have a question for Chatty. Are there any reference papers on the cosmetics application using a UV vis NIR spectrometer? Uh, yes, there is. Uh, the application note on the cosmetic uh, using the UV vis. They're available on the Perkin Elmer website. Uh, so it's uh, www.perkinelmer.com. Uh, you can look over there and you can uh, uh, look by through the search for cosmetics uh, or nanoparticle in cosmetics. You can use the IR and you should be able to get to a section 
where you have the various application nodes that have been written and published on that technology, on that, that specific platform. Okay. Um, I have another question for Jeff. How does temperature influence the spectroscopic measurements? Is the T dependence the same as with a typical absorbent sample? Uh, temperature is not – in absorbent spectroscopy, you can have an effect of temperature as it changes the, the – uh, it literally – well, I'm trying to think of an answer here that, that's fairly general. But, yes, temperature can be an issue in all UV visible near-infrared spectroscopy. However, the differences that temperature cause – are rather small, the most, the most dramatic effects of temperature would be in solution, obviously because the molecular motion there of a solution greatly has a greater impact on the sample and its solubility. Temperature is rarely a, an issue with a solid sample. I've, I've, not known, I've not known too many solid samples, unless you're talking about heating things up by several hundred degrees or so, uh, usually for solids, temperature is not, does not have much of an effect. It can have an effect in, the, in solution, but it's really not that dramatic. Usually solvent effects and polarity far outweigh the temperature effects. Okay, another one for you, Jeff. Is it possible to analyze and differentiate a collection of nanoparticles, or does, pur uh, does purification have to be done prior to the analysis? Uh, well, most of that work with the carbon nanotubes, those methods are all to evaluate the degree of purification. Uh, you can indeed, uh, the, the, the first spectra I had here, and let me see if I can push that out to you here. There you see, that is actually a mixture of nanotubes. All of those peaks are not from the same size and shape nanotubes. Uh, you'll see a number of peaks in each of the regions. So if you look at that versus this one right here, this is another mixture, and you can see we're looking at 12 different nanotube, nanotube species uh, uh, mixed together, and you could differentiate that. There, there, you, you wouldn't necessarily have to do purification. Uh, if you were really interested in, in running like this with maybe 12 species, possibly doing a second derivative on the, on the absorbent spectra would get you better resolution. The, you're going to have a lot of possibly overlapping peaks in a mixture like that. So the second derivative spectroscopy would be a way of uh, getting some band sharpening and separation. So if you were interested in doing that and couldn't find what you needed in the raw absorbent spectra, you could probably go to a second derivative and get a little bit better uh, differentiation. Okay. Um, another question for you, Jeff. We do understand that ointments are also cosmetics. However, ointments are thicker, and we believe they have more nanoparticles closely fused. Does the UV-Vis technique enable us to do that? Yes. The, it, it really doesn't matter what the consistency uh, or the viscosity of your sample is. Uh, probably in making these measurements, one of the things uh, Jillian found out in doing her work is the best way to present these samples that are either creams. Uh, some of the cosmetics she looked at were actually powders. Uh, she was actually much more versed in the composition of cosmetics than I'll ever be, but she ran a, a, a wide number of different types, from powders to some very viscous uh, uh, preparations. The viscosity really doesn't make a difference. It is it, she, she, we, You put these on kind of a frosted glass surface, in other words, or, or a quartz surface. Uh, there, are, there are actually centered quartz surfaces made and sold by uh, supply companies to do this. And you literally, uh, in smearing your cosmetic, what, what, no matter what its viscosity is, onto that centered quartz plate, uh, 
basically what you're doing is filling up the pockets in the irregular glass. So you basically put your, your preparation on there, and then you run a straight edge across it. And basically, you're then duplicating the path length. And uh, it wouldn't matter what the viscosity of, of the sample was, you would still have transparency, and you would still be able to look at the, uh, the aggregation. The, the only way to, to really do an aggregation study is to uh, make the measurements on, in the cream or the final preparation and then solubilize that because the nanoparticles, if they're aggregated, will, will uh, unaggregate and they'll, they'll go back to being nanoparticles again. And you need, to, you need to dilute them in a solvent to be able to see that difference between the aggregation in the cream or gel and then the, 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 uh, the aggregation being lost then in the, uh, in the solution sample. Okay, I have a question for Chatty. Uh, what process may be used to determine the most effective technique for nanoparticle deagglomeration? Um, this is exactly what I mean. This is exactly what Jeff was just uh, explaining. Uh, the ability of looking at the time process or the time evolution on your sample. If you are looking for a, a deagglomeration of the process, you can track it in, in time. You can have this, uh, the, the the center mount. Uh, you can have your sample, as Jeff described, on that quartz, putting in there, and you look at your your signal. And if you want to look at if, the, if those nanoparticles can disaggregate, you can go and revert to use a solvent where you can look at those particles, how they do this and uh, deagglomerate in that solvent. Um, okay, I have another question for Jeff. Can I use these techniques to characterize nanoparticles in any substrate formulation? Well, I'm not so sure I'd say any uh, formulation. Uh, it basically comes down to a sample preparation. Uh, if you're going to make a transmission measurement, the sample has to be of such a thickness that is transparent. In other words, if you put too much sample in the beam, you basically have a block of wood and you go off scale. The, these instruments are capable of making measurements up to about seven absorbance or eight absorbance units. So you do have a rather wide dynamic range. But it would be, I'm, I'm sure I haven't explored all the possibilities that nanoparticles can be formulated in, but certainly any type of, solu any type of solution, cream, or gel can be mounted on these, on these quartz support matrix. I'm thinking if you had nanoparticles in clothing, the ones that they put in to kill odor and everything, uh, it would be interesting to see if you could see these nanoparticles in reflection mode uh, I've not tried that. I see no reason why it doesn't work. Uh, but pretty much, <clears throat> unless your sample's a gas, I think we could probably find a way of, uh, of getting it into an instrument in a measurable configuration, although I won't discount the fact that someone could come up with a weird sample that couldn't be mounted. Um, okay, I think we have time for one more question. Um, for Jeff, what other color of the fatty acid, like the oil seeds, is used in the dyeing process or purpose? Okay. Um, could you repeat that question, please? Sure. Uh, what other color of the, of the fatty acid, like oil seeds, is used in the dyeing? It says purpose, dyeing purpose. Maybe okay, I'm process. assuming they're talking about the, the, the work on the milk. I'm not sure that it doesn't have anything to do with dye, uh, any type of dye material. But any, uh, in, in milk, fatty acids are in the nano range in terms of their chain length and everything, whereas the proteins are much larger. Uh, that doesn't mean that there might not be other types of constituents that are in there that fall into the nano range. Basically, any size constituent of something, milk's about the messiest sample you could probably get. If you could work out an application for milk, you could probably work out an application for anything. I was just kind of demonstrating possibilities. But 
I, I mentioned the, the long chain fatty acids as being an example of a nanoparticle there. I'm sure that there might possibly be other constituents that fall into that range. Uh, if you were looking at something different than milk, like certain types of natural oils, I don't know enough about the composition of things there, but it's, it's a possibility. Okay, thank you both for those insightful answers. Unfortunately, we are out of time. I want to thank the audience for their interesting questions and participation in today's event. I would like to extend my thanks to our sponsor, Perkin Elmer, for making today's educational webcast possible. We will follow up directly to any questions that we did not get to during today's webinar. Please note that this webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through April of 2016. You will receive an email from Spectroscopy alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. We'll see you next time. Goodbye. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast of the diversity of UV Viz NIR techniques for nanomaterial characterization, how to use transmission, scatter transmission, diffuse reflectance, and angular resolve scattering measurements to characterize nanostructures. I'm Meg LaRue, Managing Editor of Spectroscopy, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this